sometimes we wait until the end of the service. I want to read these now just to let them begin to percolate in your heart and your mind. And at the end during ministry time, maybe one of these connects with where you are. Um, and then let's allow the Spirit to sort of guide this. Um, some words, though, that we've been praying over and maybe this connects with where you are. Um, I've got eight of these. I'll read them as they are. One, number one, the Lord says, I will pay off a debt that is beyond your ability to pay. So maybe that's something, maybe that's you. I know a lot of us have debt that we're not able to pay off. But the Lord is speaking to someone saying, I will pay off a debt that's beyond your ability to pay. Number two, I'll sustain them during times of turmoil. The Lord says, wait for the shaking to end, and then see that there is a new day. So maybe if someone's going through any kind of a season of turmoil, the Lord wants that word for you. Number three, I'm giving someone a gift of miracles. I want you to be encouraged and to step out. Step out. If you've been asking for that gift, step out. Um, number four, prepare for a career shift. I'm changing how people know you, the Lord says. Um, uh, the fifth one is I'm preparing you through trial and travail and preparing you to carry a greater calling. Allow yourself to be formed. Do not be discouraged, but stand firm. And then three physical, specific, very specific physical words. Number one, someone who has a, a tearing in their left knee, maybe a ligament tendon, something in your left knee. Uh, we believe the Lord wants healing for that. Now, um, the sixth one, there is a gastrointestinal disease that I'm healing, the Lord says. And finally, healing of hearing. The Lord says, I'll restore the hearing of your youth. So if anyone has a hearing issue, you've had that for years and years. Um, we're going to believe that maybe today the Lord wants to heal that. So at the end of the service, um, we're going to come and pray for you. If, if one of those connects with who you are, we can believe the Lord will heal you in during the teaching time. We've seen that. So it's God who heals, right? It's not the people up at the front. He does it. <laughs> so how much more greater is his glory if he just does it right here and now in the next few minutes? It would be fantastic. Awesome. Okay. Beautiful. You're a beautiful bunch of people. You know that? <laughs> Praise God for you. I'm going to be taking my glasses off because I can read better, but it means I can't see you really. So if I'm like really getting into it, I'm like looking and pointing and I'm looking at you. I don't know it's you. All right. I can't tell who it is. So don't get offended. I'm just going to leave these off for a little bit and get into it. So, hey, we're going to be in, uh, in Acts chapter one this morning. If you have, if you don't have a Bible, we call these the analogs. We've got some copies of the analogs right up here. We, we are, I'm encouraging you, and Meg has mentioned this before, to use this, not this one right here necessarily, but a physical Bible. Um, there's, just, there's something about the brain connection digitally that, that you know, studies are showing that we tend to retain more if we have something like this in front of us as opposed to a screen. So you're going to be retaining it more and more. I'd encourage you to bring your own Bible as well. Um, if you don't have one, these are up here as well. Um, but also, if, you, if you're a parent, if you've got kids, it's, 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 it's going to be really important that you're modeling the reading of the word, the study of the word for them. This is going to be more caught than taught. So it's great to teach them about it. It's even more important to model a lifestyle of being in the word. And between these two things, you can be reading the word on both, right? I got this open or I got this open. When, when your kids come along and look at you and you have this, they know what you're doing, right? You with me? Yeah. If you got the Bible app, and you're reading and your kids come along, they don't know exactly what you're doing, right? So in their mind, there's not necessarily as strong of a connection as having a physical Bible in your hand. We're not going to be legalistic about that. That's not at all what we're doing. We just want to encourage you um, as, as, a, as, a, as a lifestyle of discipleship, get into the Word, and I'm going to encourage you to, to get into a physical Word as well. Because if your battery runs out, you're going to be stuck. Just don't have a battery. Come on, when the EMP That's hits. That's right. <laughs> exactly, when the EMP hits. All right, we're in Acts chapter 1, a message called The Ascending Life. While you're, if you're, while you're going there, um, I'll tell you a little bit of, um, about, you know that Megan and I, we have a, a small farm, and we have some livestock on our farm, goats specifically. Long story to that, but goats teach me more about myself than anything else that I've encountered in the world. You know, Jesus compares us to sheep and goats. I wish I could say it was more like sheep, but I don't have sheep, but I'm definitely a lot like a goat sometimes. I can be stubborn, and I can dig my feet in and not want to go somewhere. I can, you know, do things that I don't really want to go. Um, and we have, you know, I spent the, the better part of the last three years trying to improve fencing on our back pasture. 
And I thought I had decent fencing, but if you, if there's any question, get goats and they will prove you wrong. <laughs> they have caused me more grief in fencing than I could ever have imagined. I would like repair it and then the neighbor would text me. The neighbor would text me in the middle of church. Brad, this is your neighbor. Your goats are out again. And I'd like be stressing out the whole time. I'm like, Meg, we gotta go. And I have to run home and figure out why. Of course, by the time I get there, they're all back in the, my own pasture looking at me all innocent, you know? <laughs> so I'm in passion fences. And I think, I think I've almost got it all done, you know, because um, I've not had a problem except for one goat. Her name is Dulcinea. She is a cross between a boar and a Kiko. She's about a year old. She was born to us in, in, in March, I guess, of 2018. Um, and we've got 25, 24 or 25 goats right now. 24, we just sold one. We just sold one. Anybody wants to go. Exactly right. Um, so for probably the last two or three weeks, all has been well at Willow Hill. The goats have been in their place. They've not managed, and I've patched little holes where the little kids are going out. But every once in a while, I'm gonna, I walk outside and I'm seeing Dulcinea, not in my pasture, but in the neighbor's pasture. And I'm like pulling my hair out, like, Durr, and I'm just yelling at her and, you know, you know, saying ugly things to her and she just eats her grass and stares at me like, you know, what do you think? You know, I'm like, how in the world, what are you, how are you getting out? And she just goes on her way and I find a way, you know, I, I kind of have to like chase her and then bring her through the gate and put her back in my fence and we go on and then the next day, the same thing. I go out there and I'm like, she is not in my pasture where she's, where she's supposed to be. And so one day I'm like standing on our back deck looking out and I'm seeing Dulcinea. She's where she's supposed to be in our back pasture with all of her friends. But she begins to walk over towards the fence and begin to give it a good sniff. I'm like, ah, I'm going to see like what little hole you're digging under. I'm going to see what crack in the fence you're going through. You know, I'm going to find, you know, I'm going to see what you're doing. They'll, they'll get on their bellies and, like, crawl underneath. It's crazy what they'll do. But I'm watching, and then I see her take two or three steps back. And in the blink of an eye, she takes four steps and jumps straight over a four-and-a-half-foot fence. <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Now, Dulcinea is not the biggest goat I've got. She's not the tallest goat I've got. She is the most hard-headed one I've got. And I was like, that goat, I was like, man, come here. That goat just straight out jumped over that fin. What even a running jump. It was like three steps and over she went. And sure enough, I began to watch. And, and you know, I'd bring her back in. And the next day I'd watch. And she would just, like nothing, take two steps, clear a fence that was this high. And I've got barbed wire on the top of this. So the point of that is not, boy, don't get goats. <laughs> the point of that is, have you ever wondered if you're meant to do something bigger? You ever wonder if you're meant to be somewhere outside of the confines of where you are? You ever wondered what life is like on the proverbial other side of the fence? I can tell you, Based on my understanding of the word, based on my at least experience in the Christian life, I believe that every one of us is meant to ascend to something higher, ascend to something bigger. We're not meant for the things of this world. And we're going to look at that in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is all about ascension. And this is coming on the sort of the tail end of, of, of the gospel and the story. We, don't, we talk a lot about Easter. We talk a lot about resurrection. We don't talk a lot about the ascension of Jesus. You guys know what I mean by that? You know, we don't, we don't give it a whole lot. I think back in my own life, I don't think I've ever heard many sermons talking about this. You know, but it's part of what we believe. We believe that it's, it is as historically true as the resurrection. It's as historically true as the ministry of Jesus. It's as historically true as the birth. All these things are true, including this very strange event that happens in Acts chapter 1. We're going to kind of read through that. You know, what, so what does that, what does that mean for us? Why? Why, why did the writers include this? I, become, I believe it's because we are meant to have an ascending kind of life as well. And this is where I get some amens. Amen. Amen. Chuck, come on. Got your back. That's right. All right, we're going to jump in here. What does it mean? I want to give you uh, like four principles of living an ascending kind of life. Four, uh, maybe not even four principles, but, but four realities that if we say yes to this kind of life, if we say yes to an Acts chapter 1 kind of life, an ascending life, 
a life of moving up from where we are into the greater things that God has for us. Four realities that we're going to come face to face with, that we're going to encounter. All right? The first one of these is, is found in, in the first several verses. We're in, uh, in, in Acts, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 and 2. It says this, In my former book, Theophilus, so by the way, the first encounter is this, an ascending life means kingdom expansion. Kingdom expansion. By the way, that's what we're all about here. Is this the right one, or am I pointing at the... Is that the Bible verse? No. That's our mission right here. Y'all say it with me. Can you see it? Can you guys see this? All right, let's say it together. Our mission is to... Jesus Christ the King. I, I, I can't read it. Remember the glasses thing? In your community and around the world. Oh, it was really bad. I got you guys off. I threw you off. All right. Meg, Meg say it with us. Lead it Our mission is to honor Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ the King and to expand his kingdom, kingdom in our community, community and, and around, around the world. world. All right. Zero in on that. Expand his kingdom. God's kingdom is expanding. The, exp the, the, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is expanding every single day. And we're simply saying as a church, we want to hitch our wagon to this. We want to be a part of what he's doing. So uh, living in a sinning kind of life, first of all, means that. It means that we are grounded in an expanding kingdom. Look at what it says in Acts 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. By the way, who wrote the book of Acts? Anybody know? Luke. Luke. I'm going to raise this up. Somebody really short was preaching last week. Who was that? Matt. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Hear me, hear me. going to hold this. That's right. All right. Right there. It falls over. And he can't touch it. I can. The music stand. You're good. No, it's fine. Right there. I'm, just, I'm not going to get in there. Yeah, Luke, Luke wrote it. The, the gospel writer wrote Luke. Also wrote Acts. They're, they're sort of, you know, two books that are meant to go together. In the beginning of Luke, or in Luke, he tells all the story about all that Jesus did. And in Acts, he's telling the story about what the Holy Spirit did through the apostles. So he's referencing his previous book. And he says, in that book that I wrote to you, all that Jesus Began, isn't that cool that he said began to do and teach? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. It's like he started the work, but he didn't finish it. It's Come like he, he started this kingdom expansion, but he left it undone, and then he's going to do something else. All that he began to do and teach until the day he was taken up through heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the, to the apostles he had chosen. I also love this word where he says he began to do and teach, both things, action and teaching. I've, I've really been impressed with this just in, since the start of this church that we want to be a church that's about both the proclamation of the word and the demonstration of its power. It's like the two sides, like the two, two wings of the airplane, you know? We want to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in all of its entirety. We want to proclaim the, the, the word of God fully, but not just to teach those things. We want to do these things as well. We don't want to just talk about healing. We want to give people invitation to be healed. We don't want to just talk about discipleship. We want to engage in the life of a disciple. We don't want to just talk about prayer and fasting. We want to do those things as well. So Jesus began to do and teach all these things about the kingdom. Come on. Um, and for Jesus, that, that, that's, that's really what it's all about for him. It's the number one thing that he talked about. If we were to sort of go through and look at all of his teachings and the parables and everything, he always began, many of them, with the kingdom of heaven is like. Kingdom of God is like. He was all about the kingdom, and that's what I want our church to be all about. In fact, we named our church that, King's Church, because we want to be all about the king and his kingdom. And he wants us to understand something about the, the priority of the kingdom. It's not meant sort of just to be on the sidelines. It is meant to be all-consuming for you and I. And, and sort of the more, I, the more I walk through the life of Jesus and what he's teaching, I, just, I can't get away from that kind of calling. The kingdom has priority in my own life. And the more I establish it, he says this. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. What are the things that he's talking about? Well, he's been talking about food. He's been talking about money. He's been talking about all the, 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 the cares of the world that, that people seem to be concerned with. You know, when Jesus says, if you seek first the kingdom, make that your goal, make that your priority, all this other stuff is gonna be, it's gonna take care of itself. It's gonna fall into place. If the, if, 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 the, if the locomotive is at the front of the train, everything else is gonna fall behind it. He says, so really, let's, let's make sure that the kingdom is number one in our life. But 
uh, verse, look at verse 3. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Chuck, there's that 40 days. We're in this 40 days right now. This is sort of the same season when, when, when all of these events would be happening in the 40 days following the, the resurrection of Jesus. We're in a period right now called the, the season of Pentecost, leading up to the day of Pentecost. There's a 50-day period from the resurrection of Jesus until the day of Pentecost. And these 40 days sort of are when Jesus was walking in the earth and ministering to people and talking. This is what I love about it, you know? Uh, it'd be one thing, it'd be one thing if, if Jesus raised up from the dead and only presented himself to like one or two people, you know? And just have this select group come in and say, hey guys, it's really me, I raised up from the dead, but don't tell anybody, it's a secret. And he sort of, you know, was, was hiding away during this time. It'd be hard to believe the, the claim that the disciples were making. But the Bible says that during this 40-day period, he was everywhere. He was showing up to this group of people. He was showing up to that group of people. He was ministering to these. He was still doing miracles and healings and all these kind of things. There's no reason to think that he wasn't doing the same things that he had been doing all along for 40. That's a long time. Can you imagine what would happen if Jesus was, was meeting with us every day for 40 days? Imagine the kind of encounters that we would have, the kind of discipleship that we would have. Especially after he had been risen from the dead, after he had been crucified and resurrected. Now we've got all oh my word, we've got so many things to talk about. Seems flopping around, isn't it? All right, Jonathan, I may have to get that stapler. Right there. <laughs> That's right. Mail it, mail it to the door. Wouldn't that, that would be so exciting just to sit at Jesus' feet day after day and have him teach us. You know, tell us what it was like to be on the cross. Tell us what it was like during those three days when you descended into the depths. Tell us what it was like to come out of the tomb and just to hear him talk and teach. It was amazing the things that they got to experience during this, during this period with Jesus. So he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Everything he did is about the kingdom of God. Guys, let me tell you, this is what the cross means in the kingdom of God. You guys, you guys were under the assumption that I was going to come back and bring an earthly kingdom and kick out the Romans. It wasn't that way, was it? Like, no, Jesus, it wasn't that way. We had no idea. And Jesus would go on and tell them, he's like, well, Jesus, the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. It means that the last will be first, and the servant is going to be the greatest of all, as I showed you on the cross. And he began to teach them, what does it mean for the kingdom to be here on earth? And we live, in a, we live in a culture, we do, we live in a culture that's all about live for yourself, live for yourself, build up your own kingdom. And we live in a land where honestly kingdoms rise and fall all the time. Maybe not on a daily basis, but we see, we see ups and we see downs. And even now, you know, even in, even in, even in America, we, this is probably the most significant kingdom on the face of the earth the time will come and that may not be the case kingdoms rise kingdoms fall but the kingdom of jesus the kingdom of god is fixed it is forever and, and i believe that that's the first thing that god is saying is an ascending life means we have aligned ourselves and committed ourselves to the kingdom not of this world that's what we have pledged our allegiance to not to a political party, Come on. not to a nation, not to a church denomination, not to a church family, but to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That is where my allegiance lies. Amen. Yes. That's it. So an ascending life means, first of all, that it's an expanding kingdom. Second thing it means is this. It also means a spirit invasion. A spirit invasion. Uh, verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Probably during those 40 days, he was teaching them all about the gift of the father. You know, can you imagine him sitting and saying, guys, have you heard about the gift of the father? And some of them who had studied the Old Testament would say, yeah, we, we know about the promise. We know about the promises in the, in the prophets about how one day the Spirit of God would come and fill every human heart. Jesus, is that what you're talking about? And Jesus says, yeah, that's it. That's the promise of my Father. And guess what? I want you to wait for it. 
Stay here. Don't, don't leave. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere else. Stay where you are because the promise of my Father is about to be fulfilled. And he says, for John baptized with water. How many of you have been baptized with water before? The other day I was kind of, I was walking around and I was up to the sanctuary up in the baptistry and I could kind of walk and see all the little rooms for changing, you know? It's awesome. You know, it's awesome the legacy of baptisms here. If you go out in the, in the lobby right here, there's a, there's a white uh, sort of a big board out in the lobby and it's got a bunch of names all written on it. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Those are all people that have been baptized here at this church. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? There's something so amazing about just being baptized, just, the, just the, symbol, the symbolism of going down in the water and coming back, down in death, up in new life. And John was coming along, and John was baptizing them with the, for a repentance of sin. And Jesus says, that's good. That's the foundation that we're laying on. You need to, to have repentance of sin. You need to be atoned for. You need to be forgiven. You need to be made right with God. But Jesus says that there's a greater baptism that also has to happen. Not a water baptism that washes the outside, but a spirit baptism that's going to come in and cleanse the inside as well. Amen. Jesus says, that's the full promise of the Father. Wait for it. Come on. And the, 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 the Greek word, baptizo, it's where we get our word baptism. It means several different things. There's, there's kind of some word pictures that come to mind. One of those is almost like a naval term. You know, when like a ship was being, you know, w w w w was somehow attacked and it was being s submerged, it was being flooded with water and the water would kind of go into every little thing, they would use that term baptism. But another one was a laundering term. And it was it would often be used by people who are dyeing fabric and they would take this, whatever fabric it was, you know, clothes or shirt or whatever, and they would take it and they would dunk it down into the dye. They would dunk it down into the water and the dye would, would saturate every part, every little fiber of that fabric. And when it, when it was brought back out, it was an entirely different thing. There was no like little part of it that was left because it had, it had been soaked through. And it's like Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit wants to, is going to come and soak you through. Amen. He's going to invade every part of you. And when you are baptized in the Spirit, it's not just an outside symbol, it's an inward reality. And every part of you is going to be flooded with the presence of God. He says, wait for that promise. And Jesus, he's been talking about the kingdom of God for a long time. He's been um, demonstrating it, doing good things, doing great things. But he says something very unusual with his disciples. He says, um, he looks at him and says, you know, the time is going to come when you're going to do, you're going to do, Greater things than this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What's greater than this? You're, you know, Jesus, you're like, you know, healing people. You know, you're raising the dead. You're making the deaf to hear. What can be greater than this? And later on, Jesus, he doesn't really answer that yet. But later on, he begins to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. And he's gathered with these men up in the room. This is the, the evening before he's arrested and crucified. He's sitting with them giving them last instructions before everything just blows up. He begins to talk about how he's going to go away shortly. And the disciples are going to begin to lose their minds. What do you mean go away? You can't go anywhere. Or are you crazy? Jesus, you can't do this. And he says, he says, he says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. It's a good thing that I'm leaving. <clears throat> For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. He says, if I stay, he can't come. And you really, really, really need him to come down. I'm one person right here. I can't do the same things that the Holy Spirit will do when he come down, comes down and baptizes you in fire. He says, it's a good thing that I go away. Uh, I'm convinced this, that the real gospel is not just my sins are unforgiven. And I have a ticket to heaven. That's not, the, that's not the full gospel. The full gospel is not so much that God is, is, is with us in the person of Jesus. It's also that God is in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the heart of each one of us, every man, woman, boy, and girl. So an ascending life means that we are living in the reality of a spirit invasion. 
If we want to have an ascending life, if we want to have a life that's higher than the mundane, higher than the ordinary, then we need to say, God, I know you've got more for me. I know that your spirit wants to soak through every part of me. That's a bold prayer to pray. If you've not done that before, that's a bold thing to ask for, because God will do it. And it's the most beautiful thing in the world. The ascending life means we are saturated by an invasion of the Holy Spirit. We're a people of the Spirit, under the leadership of the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, and sanctified by the Spirit. Can I say it enough? <laughs> Third thing is this. It also means a global commission. Come on. That means a global commission. Let's look at verse 6. Acts 1, verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They've been wanting to ask this question for a long time. You know, they're, they're just itching to know. It's like, okay, God, really, I, I, I get it. All right, Jesus, we appreciate the cross. We appreciate the resurrection. But when are you going to make things right in the world? When are you going to come and judge the wickedness that's been done to us? When is your kingdom really going to be established here and now in the way that we want to see it? And Jesus says this. He said, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, none of your business. You're on a need-to-know basis and you don't need to know. But, so, well, let's tell you, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. If you've been in the Christian church for, I'd say, 30 years, you've gone through these seasons and cycles of uh, sort of different prophecies about when the world will end. Anybody remember in the 80s, 88 reasons why the world will end in 1988 or something to that effect? How Lindsay wrote the book. You know, he had such a good heart, but boy, was he obviously off because it's, you know, 25 years later. Every few years, we get another one of those. I remember even five or six years ago, there was this you know, person out in California that said, it's going to happen on 2012 or whatever it was. And just the clock was counting down. We watched and, you know, the earth, world didn't end. So anybody that comes to you and says, hey, I've done the calculations. I've read the ancient codes. You know, I have, I have got a revelation from God and the world is going to end on such and such and such a day. That is a malarkey. Run away from that. We don't know. We have no idea. You know, there are signs that he's given us, but we don't know the exact day, nor should we. It's not up to us to know that. Because things would change for us. We would live our lives differently if we knew exactly when it would happen. He says, it's not for you to know these things. But you know what? I, I can tell you something. I have a good idea. And I think, I think there's something that we can put our finger on to know the end is imminent. And it comes from, it comes from Matthew uh, 24, 14. It's not up here, so you have to listen to me. G Jesus says this in Matthew 24. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom, which is what we've been talking about, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all, say all, all. nations. Say nations. nations. All nations. So this is what Jesus says, that this gospel will be proclaimed to all nations. These are not political nations. These are ethnic groups, all people groups. And then, says Jesus, the end will come. Did you get that? Can we know when the end will come? Somewhat, yes. It's not a set hour and a date it is a complete the mission kind of a thing. Come on. Jesus says, when the mission is over, then the end will come. We've got a mission. So what is that mission? What do we need to do? Jesus says that. You know? He says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. He's waiting on the church to carry out a mission. You know, and the problem is the disciples are really, they're, they're focused on the yin. It's like, okay, you've been crucified, you've been raised up, you've been resurrected. Let's get on to glory. You know, it reminds me of the time I was watching a football game. 
pro, NFL pro, professional football players. That's all they do. I was watching this game, and you know, on, on, somehow something happened, and there was a there was an interception, right? You guys know what an interception is, where the defending team picks the ball off and begins to run, and this guy he intercepts the ball. I don't know what team it was. Probably the Browns. No offense. He's probably running this way. He intercepts somebody. He's running all the way to the end zone. You know where the end zone is? This is the end zone. This is where the touchdown line is. You cross the end zone, you get six points, maybe seven. This dude is so excited. He is like running. No one is behind him. There's no defenders. He has an open stretch all the way for six points. And he's like doing the little strut, kind of a little cocky little strut walk. And he gets and he spikes the ball. And he, everybody's so excited. And everybody's cheering. And everybody's cheering until the referee calls it a dead ball. Because he spiked the ball before the end zone. I hate to be in that locker room after that game. You don't celebrate until it's over. Come on, man. We've got work to do, things to do. He says, tells the disciples, you know, <laughs> look at where they're going to go. Jerusalem. Hey, we like Jerusalem. This is where we live. I like that. All Judea. Okay, well, if I can be back on weekends, Jesus, I'll go to Judea. <laughs> he says, oh, you're also going to go to Samaria, that place of, like, you know, the mixed race kind of people that you hate so much, you're going to be going there too. And you're going to be going to the whole ends of the earth. The church is called to leave it. And it says this. It says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That witness word, that's not an apologetic thing. It doesn't say you're going to be my seminary professors to the ends of the earth. It doesn't say you're going to be my, you know, preacher teachers. You're not going to be my apostles. You're not going to be my prophets. A witness is simply someone who stands and says, I have experienced something to be true, and I will give my witness about that. In a courtroom, right? You go to a courtroom and they have witnesses up there. They don't ask the witnesses to talk about things that they don't know. In fact, if they do talk about things they don't know, the judge will cut them off. All they're expected to do is say, this is what I've heard. This is what I've experienced. This is what I know to be true. That's it. That's all, that's all Jesus is saying that we have to do. Come on. All we have to do is give testimony as to who God is in our life and what he's done in our life. Come on, man. You're going to be my witnesses in, these, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're called to leave and to go. We're not called to be in a rabbit hole. Come on. We lived in Jackson, Mississippi for a while during seminary days, and there was a, a particular, one of the counties surrounding us built a small little uh, subdivision. They were wanting to sort of, you know, open it up to a lot of the Bible Belt people in the Deep South, and they had all these beautiful houses built, and they decided they were going to really give this a, 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 a spiritual Bible Belt kind of name. So, you could drive and you could buy a house on Koinonia Boulevard. How's that sound? Hallelujah Lane, I kid you not. Hallelujah Lane. Anybody want a house on Hallelujah Lane? All your neighbors would be Christians. Come on. <laughs> your postman. Postman probably prophesy every time he delivers the mail. It only brings good things. There's a gate to keep out all the riffraff. You don't have riffraff on Hallelujah Lane. Bless their hearts. Good God, no. Yeah. The ascending life means we don't live rabbit hole Christianity. We're on a global mission. We're in the dirt, in the hurt, we're in the trenches yeah. right. of human suffering. And it means the more that we ascend, the deeper down we go. Come on, man. If you really want to know it, an ascending life is a down in the dirt kind of life. Come on, man, preach. You know what minister means in, in, in the Greek, by the way? I'm throwing a little bit of Greek at you. Diakonos. Am I right, Brian? It sounds right. Sounds right. <laughs> Pretend like it is. <laughs> literally means through the dust. Yeah. Anybody want to be a minister in the Church of Jesus Christ? Guess where you're going to go? Come on, man. Preach. In the dirt. Washing dirty feet. That's good, man. Serving the least. But you know what makes this possible? Spirit of invasion makes it possible. How can we go? How can we love? How can we serve? We can't unless that spirit invasion thing happens. Unless I'm baptized in the spirit, unless I'm full of the spirit of God, I can't possibly go down in the dirt. 
But if I'm really filled with the Spirit of God, there's no place I'd rather be because that's where Jesus is. Amen. And I find joy and satisfaction in going and sending and praying and serving. Even if I don't go around the world, I can go next door. I can go to the prisons here. I can go to my neighbor, who I don't really like a lot. I can serve them, though. Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Finally, this it means a kingdom ascension means a kingdom, or an ascending life means a kingdom expansion, spirit invasion, and global commission. Finally, it means this: a reigning and returning Christ. Come on, man. Verse nine. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. This blows my mind. <laughs> 